I, I always keep muscle memory saying you kids are dismissed, but there's nowhere to go. So <laughs> uh, I just was, as I'm preparing these things, I'm, I'm looking at the Sermon on the Mount uh, with Jesus. I'm spending time in prayer and looking at these things, and I'm thinking, uh, you said these things, and now you want me to say something. You want me to teach on these things. And if you guys like spicy food, I think these next couple weeks, they're a little bit more like uh, a Thai or an Indian dish than they are like American burgers. Um, they're a little bit spicy, but I think we need to have the hearts, and we want to have the hearts that say, Jesus, wherever you want to lead us, whatever you want to take us to to get to the green pastures, we're willing to go because we trust you because you're a good shepherd. And so I just want to pray and invite uh, the Lord by His Spirit to come here and walk among us and to meet our hearts and to prepare our hearts uh, to, to, to hear this, how Jesus wants to extract anger out of our souls. Father God, uh, we come here, we place our hearts before you. We know that our hearts are, are open and bare before you already. You can see into all of them. You, you look in our hearts, you know what's in there, and you know how prevalent anger is in our culture and how easily it flares up in my life and how it, and I'm sure it flares up in, in one another's lives. And you want to extract that from us. You want to, you want to move us away from that and you want to do something different. And so we pray for a willingness in our heart to hear these things that you teach Jesus, to believe you, to love you, and to trust you as you're commanding us to walk out of these things into a different style of life. Speak to our souls, shepherd us well. I thank you for this church. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, and our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, so we're in a series called uh, that, The Gospel of Matthew. We're in season two where we're t learning how Jesus is teaching the kingdom. And uh, what I want to do today is, is look at how our culture thinks about anger and culture, how it justifies it, and how Jesus is going to say something completely different than that. So I think I would just like to just kind of look at our culture, our culture's perception of anger and how it's rapidly changed over the last 60 years. And so anger used to be looked at in our culture as something that was wrong. It was something that was kind of looked down upon and, and uh, it wasn't looked as a noble trait. It was more of a vice than a virtue. And so if we just use uh, Hollywood as an example or the music industry, uh, I, just, I can just think of the classic movie, Seven, uh, what's it called? Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, right? And so grumpy, he's got a little bit of an anger issue. He's kind of a grumpy person and we kind of think it's cute but we kind of look down on him, and culturally at that time, it was kind of like, oh, grumpy, you're just grumpy, right? And we was kind of looked down upon, and, and you, you watch old westerns that were in black and white, and the good guys, maybe they would dole out justice to the world, but they would always do it in a controlled way. They were never a loose cannon. And now in Hollywood, we see a completely different type of thing. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But what happened is in the 1950s, and then eventually into the 1960s, there was the Vietnam War. And there was a, the hippie movement, and then there was the moral outrage of our, of our governments and our institutions and the desire to push off authority, right? And, and so things started to change, and it started to escalate. In the 1960s and 70s, this happened, but in the 80s, there was a real push against the authority of the institutions that we have. And um, there started to become this justification in the public sphere that anger was a good thing. It was a vehicle of liberation. And so even now in movies, uh, we, we, we love watching movies where the good guy, uh, he's relatable or she's relatable to us because there's a lot of gray. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of conflict in their souls. And we like it more because we can relate to them. But this righteous indignation has become a virtuous symbol of liberation and goodness, and the lines have a little bit become blurred. And so in his book, uh, The Divine Conspiracy, Dallas Willard talks about this, and he says that uh, it's almost like it's a part of self-expression, self-development, and self-defense. Anger is an essential part of my emotional well-being, and I think it's a good thing. And so our culture has justified it, and it's, a, it's become an inherent tool that humans believe we need to utilize. But I want us to just quickly do an honest gut check moment. If I'm being honest with myself, how often am I angry with the injustice, uh, the real injustice of the circumstance, versus how often am I angry with the person who's committed the sin? Is there grieving in my heart that this type of sin exists in our world and sometimes in me? 
Or does this anger manifest and flare up only when I see it in other people? Is the anger and hatred toward the sin, or is it toward the person who's getting in the way of uh, the things that I believe I deserve? And so in, in Proverbs 20, verse 27, it says, The lamp of the Lord searches the heart, the spirit of a man. It searches out his inmost being. And the main idea that I want to bring to us today is that Jesus sits on this mountain, the Sermon on the Mount mountain, as the almighty judge of the human heart. And our culture justifies and it normalizes anger. But King Jesus knows our hearts better than this. Will we let him perform his surgery on us now in our anger so he won't have to perform his judgment on us later? And so I, I like, I've been reading uh, a couple different books with commentaries, and one of them is Cost of Discipleship. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer says that in order to us to understand Jesus' words, we have to have him as our master. We can't separate these words from Jesus himself. And he says the Son of God is the author and the giver of the law. Only those who apprehend the law as the word of Christ are in a position to fulfill it. Only by knowing Christ as the giver and the fulfiller of the law can we attain to a true knowledge of the law. And so I just invite you now, Jesus is going to say some things in this passage which shock us, they maybe scare us, they maybe offend us, but Jesus is this good master and he's saying, if you're connected to me, these things make sense. If you let me speak into your soul, I can heal them, but it's on my terms. I'll heal you the way I want to do it. Let me do this. And so I want to just read the verses and just talk about them and explain how they work. Terence read it, and I'm going to read little sections, and I'm going to talk about this. In Matthew 5, verse 21, 22, this is what Jesus says. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. And so Jesus is quoting from Moses here, and if you look in Exodus 21, Moses is kind of explaining how this works. And he's saying if, if you accidentally kill someone, like you're, you're chopping wood and the axe head flies off and it knocks somebody in the head and it kills them, that's called manslaughter. And if that happens, you can flee to what's called a city of refuge and you can hide there so that the, the grieving family won't take justice and vengeance on you because it's not out of the heart. It was an accident. But if it was intentional and you murdered somebody because of the hatred or the anger in your heart, you will be subject to judgment. And the judgment, he says, is that you will be executed. You'll be destroyed. You'll be executed for taking another person's life. Because manslaughter is not in the heart. It was an accident. But murder is the outflow of what the heart desires. And so I want us to look at these, these three examples Jesus says. Jesus says, that was what Moses said. I want to wrap this up. I want to show you how, how actually anger and murder in the heart actually is a deeper thing. And so the first example of murder in the heart is just a generalized anger. If someone becomes angry with somebody else, Jesus is saying that they get to face the same consequences as if they had killed them. Can you guys notice that in verse 21 and 22? Can you guys see that? It's exact same consequence if we're angry with somebody as if we murdered them. And so Jesus' audience recognizes, he's saying if somebody angers somebody, if you're angry with somebody else, you are subject to execution. You can, you, guys, you guys see that? Jesus is talking about a heavenly court. He's not, the, the people of that time don't care if you insult or if you're angry with people. But Jesus is saying, be careful about that. The second example in the murder of the heart is when we slanderously degrade other people. If we slanderously devalue a brother or sister through insult, we stand guilty before God's divine counsel. And so, does anybody speak Aramaic here? No? I didn't think so. I'm just, check, I'm just checking. So that word in Aramaic is, is raka. And so depending on your Bible translation, it'll just leave it there or it'll explain what that is. And raka means empty. It's, it's, like it's, it's an insult that you say to people like raka. That means you're empty-headed or you're empty or you're worthless. You have no value. There's nothing of value here. You're just, just whatever. 
This is the term that Jesus is using. He said, if you use this term, you will be guilty before the Sanhedrin. Does anybody know who the Sanhedrin is? So the Sanhedrin is the, the court, that room that, that Jesus stands for at the end of his life. And there's, they, they all, there's 70 of them, they execute Jesus. Uh, Jesus isn't talking about this Sanhedrin. That word in Greek simply means the council. It's just a Greek word that means the council. And in the Old Testament, we hear about this thing called the divine council, where God and the angels are all gathered together, and they pass judgment on humans. This is what Jesus is referring to. He's not talking about the Sanhedrin that he stood for because those high priests and those people could care less if I insulted you. If I brought that to them, they'd be like, that's petty, get this out of here. Jesus is talking about a heavenly court. Okay, here's the third example of murder of the heart. is when we have contemptuous, uncontrolled outbursts of anger. When we lose all control and in rage kill somebody with our words, when hatred is unbridled and on display for everybody to see, Jesus is saying that we're actually in danger of the fire of hell itself. So what do you guys make of these three ideas? Jesus is saying, if you actually physically kill somebody, you will be found, you, you can be punishable by death in Moses' court. In my court, if you're angry with somebody, if you insult people or degrade them or devalue somebody who's an image bearer, or if you full-on just have a rage outburst, you will stand before my court, and someday, if you don't figure this out and this becomes habitual in your life, you will receive my execution. What do you guys think about this? These are, these are bold words by Jesus, and these aren't things that we typically think about when we think about God. We think about Christ. I think sometimes when I've read this in the past, I've, I've kind of looked at it as like a graded system. Like if we do a little bit of harm, then there's a little bit of punishment. And if we go all the way down to you fool, uh, somehow that's worse than calling somebody empty-headed. I'll be in danger of hell. And so it's kind of like a graded system. But I, I was reading this and I was looking at, I was researching this, and they're saying that this isn't what's going on. This is actually what's called, uh, in, if you, there's any, any English literature nerds out here? Any, any first book? You want, I'm, I, I like that kind of stuff too. Uh, this is called parallelism. And what Jesus is doing is he's saying the same thing, these consequences, he's saying the same thing three times in a different way. He's saying if you have anger, if you insult people and you treat them like they don't have dignity and you, you downcry their image, and if you have outbursts of anger, you will stand before me someday. If you don't get, if you don't get this figured out in your life, someday you will stand before me and I will judge you in the divine court. What do you guys think of that? It's sobering, because Jesus is saying, like, your culture probably doesn't care about this, but I do. I'm very concerned about this. Jesus, I think, is, is he's, he's concerned about our justification of anger in our culture and how personally we sometimes look at it and maybe you're like me and we sometimes think, well, it's not physical abuse, it's not death, it's not really that bad. So like if I anger or if I, if I freak out on somebody and they lose control, it's just a part of being human. But I, wanna, I, want, I want you to read here what Bonhoeffer in his book says about what God is thinking about our hearts when we're committing these things. We don't think of it as a serious thing, but what is God thinking about when we have anger in our heart. He says, anger is always an attack on our brother's life, for it refuses to let him live and aims at his destruction. Jesus will not accept the common distinction between righteous indignation and unjustifiable anger. The disciple must be entirely innocent of anger because anger is an offense against both God and his neighbor. Every idle word which we think so little of betrays our lack of respect for our neighbor and shows that we place ourselves on a pinnacle above him and value our own lives higher than his. And so secretly, I don't think any of us are thinking these things when we get angry, when we outburst. We think it's acceptable. And, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer is saying, when we're doing this, do we understand what's actually happening in our heart? Because our master can see what's in the heart even if we don't think it's a big deal. He says, the angry, blow, the angry word is a blow struck at our brother, a stab at his heart. It seeks to hit, to hurt, and to destroy. A deliberate insult is even worse, 
For we are then openly disgracing our brother in the eyes of the world and causing others to despise him. With our hearts burning with hatred, we seek to annihilate his moral and material existence. We are passing judgment on him, and that is murder, and the murderer himself will be judged. Okay, I just want to, I want to pause here for a minute. I'm reading this kind of stuff this week, and I had a couple anger flare-ups. I had a couple times when I was frustrated with people, and I, I was thinking in my heart, it's because you're an idiot, and you don't see things my way. And I was starting to flare up in my heart. I don't know how common this is with you when we get frustrated with somebody else who doesn't see our perspective. And I was starting to do these things, but I'm reading this kind of stuff and I'm thinking, Jesus, do you actually view what's happening in my heart as more serious than I do? Do I think of this thing as actually serious and this could send me to hell if I continue this type of habitual thing? I'm moving into the kingdom of darkness. Do I actually believe you, Jesus? And I'm looking at these things and I'm thinking, I think I believe what my culture has bred me to think. Everything I just explained that Dietrich Bonhoeffer said and, and the words of Jesus, what would happen if I took my Bible and read to them, murder's a big deal. I went to Vernon and I grabbed a microphone and a video camera and I said, what do you think of murder? You think murder's wrong? Yes. And then if I, I laid out these three things that were just given here and I said, do you think that these should be punishable by death? Becoming angry with somebody, insulting people and degrading them, or outbursts of anger, like just full-on rage attacks. Do you think these should be punishable by death? What do you think the response would be on a video camera if I got a big survey of 100 people in Vernon and Armstrong? What do you guys think? What would be culture's opinion if I explained verses 22 and, uh, and explaining that this is probably what God sees when he looks inside Steve's heart, not what Steve sees? So when is, in our culture right now, when is anger justified? Like, I don't think everybody, I don't think our culture is full out saying, like, we should be rageaholics, but is there any time where our culture says it's justified to be angry with other people? Our governments? To be angry toward them. Yeah. yeah. Our culture, I think, thinks that's good. Mistreating other people? Other living things? And, and some of these things aren't bad, but I, I think that there's a couple. When we perceive a power imbalance, when there's an unwritten social rule broken, when someone appears to be a victim, or when my personal rights have been violated, in these situations, our culture doesn't just condone, but it celebrates anger. And I want us to think about this. When our culture thinks these things, are they following God's heart or not? Because I, um, I want to give you two examples here, okay? And I'm not saying that they're both good or one's bad, one's good. I don't want to judge the situation. I just want you to understand and to think about how our culture thinks about these two very different things. So the, I want you to think about in the United States, in the last couple of years, there's been anti-police brutality riots. And they've been affiliated with Antifa and Black Lives Matter. And, and there's been some condemnation over the action of the mobs, but there's also a lot of people who are applauding this as a necessary and honorable reaction. Right? So burning cars, destruction of property, anger and violence, these are all seen as healthy expressions of anger because it's a form of liberation. And I'm not saying that police brutality is good, but I'm saying that there is a, there's a sense where this is a good thing that needs to happen. Whether that's right or wrong, I want us to understand our culture thinks that this is good to a certain degree. Now, I want us to think about, uh, in 2011, how bad the Vancouver Canucks suck. We got, all the way to the, we got all the way to the finals, and we blew it on game seven. And right after that, I was watching people are like turning cars upside down, and they're burning buildings, and it's just like out of control. People are getting concussions, and I'm watching all of this, and I'm thinking, this is absolutely ridiculous. And there was universal denouncement of this, right? And maybe, maybe that's a good thing. This is a, this is a game. You guys are nuts. But I want us to see, can we see the difference in our culture, how we look at anger, and we say, well, maybe there's some good in this anger, and this type of anger is not good. Can you guys see the difference? Our culture has a sense of moral conviction. 
But I want us to understand that when we do this in our own hearts, I think we can easily deceive ourselves. I don't know about you, but I can. And I I think what Jesus is saying is that uh, most forms of anger actually aren't actually good anger. And even though I teach myself in my heart and I justify it, God knows what's really in there. Jesus alone, the master, can tell us which types of anger and injustice, uh, anger over injustice is necessary. And I, I know um, there are times in our life where we do need to have in, in indignation, righteous anger over injustice. But we also need to ask the Lord to give us the discernment to know when it's against the sin and the desire to see that out of God's good creation and when there's a hatred for our brother. Because I don't think we are very good at being able to distinguish and tell the difference. And we need God's Spirit to come and say, this type of anger is destroying you. Jesus is saying that if anger in any of these forms takes over a life, and it's not repented and cleansed of, it has the power to eventually separate us from King Jesus' kingdom. It can separate us from our Lord, and it can actually put us on the destination to hell itself in the kingdom of darkness. And I want us to think about this, that Jesus has just finished saying, blessed are the, the meek, blessed are the poor in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the merciful. The kingdom of God belongs to these types of people. And if we refuse to become what Jesus is, how do we think that we're going to end up in his kingdom? And so Jesus sits on the mountain as the almighty judge of our human hearts. And even though our culture justifies and normalizes anger, Jesus knows better. Will we let him perform his surgery on our anger now in our souls so he won't have to perform his judgment on us later? And so how can Jesus be so utterly different than our culture? How come Jesus cares about anger and its influence and power in our life so bad? Why does Jesus care about this? I think verse 23 and 24 is going to help us. Jesus says, if, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Do you guys know what's going on here? What Jesus is talking about? Yeah, so the the scenario that Jesus is painting a picture of is there's this thing called a fellowship or a thanksgiving offering. Okay, and so Jewish people did this. This isn't an offering that you do because you're trying to get to be right with God with sin. This is something that you do out of a thankful heart. It's above and beyond. It's a thankful offering where you, 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 you give it some grains to God and they burn the grains and the incense goes up to God. The, the aroma goes up to God and it's saying to God, thank you. This, is, this isn't like you're trying to do something for God. It's just straight up saying, thank you, that I'm connected to you and that you're connected to me. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love that you would go that distance and you made the covenant with me. Thank you that I'm connected to you. That's what Jesus is talking about here. This is a real offering that people would do. And Jesus is saying, if you are there about to say to God, thank you for the connection that I have with you, and you don't have a connection with your brother or your sister, that you're not actually connecting to God that God will not hear your prayers. You don't have a connection to God because you've lost connection to your brother or your sister. Have you guys ever thought about this? That if I am not on good terms with my brothers and sisters, God is not on good terms with me. Listen to what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says. I I think Dietrich Bonhoeffer is 100% true. I think this is what Jesus is saying. When a man or a woman gets angry with his brother or sister and swears at him, And when he publicly insults or slanders him, he's guilty of murder and forfeits his relationship to God. He erects a barrier not only between himself and his brother, but also between himself and God. He no longer has access to him. His sacrifice, his worship, and his prayer are not acceptable in his sight. For the Christian, worship cannot be divorced from the service or the connection to my brother or sister, as it is with the Pharisees. If we despise our brother, our worship is unreal and it forfeits every divine promise. 
When we come before God with hearts full of contempt and unreconciled with our neighbors, we are, both individually and as a congregation, worshiping an idol. Woo! This is a little spicy. So long as we refuse to love and serve our brother and make him an object of contempt and let him harbor a grudge against me or the congregation, our worship and sacrifice will be unacceptable to God. What do you guys think of that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, so we're, we're, we're like that. So, yeah. Right. So, you're right. So, we, when we take Jesus' words, we have to take into account everything Jesus says on this topic. And so, Jesus is going to say in, the, in the, the Sermon on the Mount later. He's going to say, if you do not forgive your, your brother, God will not forgive you. And so there, you're right, Leanne. There has to be a willingness where we have our hands out. We have a willingness to want to make connection. But we don't leave Jesus behind to make connection with somebody else. And so Jesus wants to reconcile us to the world. And he wants there to be connections with each other. But if, I, if somebody is living in evil... And if I make peace with them who are living in evil, I'm leaving God behind, right? Do you see what I'm saying? So it, what he's saying here is not, if somebody, if somebody kills my child, I don't pretend that God wants me to be connected to that person without having to resolve the evil there. I'd be leaving God behind to be able to make peace with them. I'm making peace with evil at the expense of having peace with God. Yes. As long as it depends on you. Right, so there has to be a willingness. But if the person is not loving, if we tell the person to continue to live in the kingdom of darkness and not come with us into the kingdom of light where our master is too. Right? This is, that's really good, Leanne. Right, so... Right, so Jesus is saying in general with anger, and there's some, some very good situations where there has to be a sense where we will hold this with the person and we will say, this is not right. This isn't part of God's good creation. And if we don't deal with this, I can love you. I can love you as my enemy, like Jesus says, but I cannot embrace you as if there's nothing wrong here. That would be wrong. That's a very good clarification. Okay. But I'm just saying that in general, if I have anger towards my brother and I refuse to have the willingness to move to him, Jesus, I think, is saying, you have lost your connection to me. What do you guys think of that? Here, I want to, I want to, Jesus four times in our passage says, brother. Four times in our passage, Jesus is telling us that the person who we're angry with or hateful toward is our brother. And later in the Gospel of, of Matthew, Jesus is going to say, your enemy is your neighbor. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I think it's the having the heart that recognizes that these people are a victim of sin too. And that, that the perpetrator, the evil person, they're not so evil that we dehumanize them. They are victims, and God wants them to be free too. God will punish sin in the end. And those who do not separate themselves from sin will be destroyed with it. And I think that's what it's saying in Romans 12 that you just said, Mike. I think he's saying, leave the vengeance up to the Lord, 
But there will be, it will be coming for those who do not enter into the shalom, into the kingdom of light. There's, there's way more going on here, but I, can, I have to reel this in because it's our 29 minutes here. We tend to dehumanize people when we're mad at them and we objectify them so we don't have to give them the dignity they deserve as a person who reflects the glory of God. We separate ourselves from identifying with them so we can hate them as other, not neighbor or brother. They're, they're animals, they're monsters, so I don't have to love them the way that God loves them. We devalue them in our minds so that we can hate them without feeling guilty. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to speed this up here. I'm off track because you guys are throwing, you guys are throwing curveballs. <laughs> so I want to read the last section of what Jesus is saying here. And I, I really want to help us to understand that Jesus is a judge. And if Jesus is saying opposite of what you and Leanne Le- and Mel, what you're saying is really good. If, if we think that Jesus is this fluffy teddy bear who's saying just love everybody and it doesn't matter in the end, I think we're missing Jesus. Jesus says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. Jesus is using a practical example of real life. So if I I got a neighbor, I back my truck up into his car, and for some reason there's $5,000 worth of damage. And if I'm like a complete... If I, if I don't love him, I dehumanize him, and I blame him, and I do not desire to connect with him and to reconcile and to bring shalom and peace into the situation, he may take me to court, and I have to pay for a brand new vehicle or the damage. I might have to pay for all the, the courts or everything that's involved, and it'll be more damaging to me on earth than if I would have just had a heart that wanted to reconcile instead of sitting down in my anger. And that's what Jesus is using an example here in verse 25 and 26. And he's saying, uh, on earth, if you live in anger habitually, it will destroy you. You will suffer the consequences. If we live lives that burn bridges all the time, we get to suffer. And so there's a family member that I know in my extended family, and this person lives the opposite of these verses. He consistently burns bridges and lives in anger and devalues people and it's caught up with him and his life sucks. The bitterness and the fuel on the fire, it just leads to something bigger and it destroys a human life here on earth. But I want us to recognize in verses 25 and 26 that Jesus is not just talking about physically the consequences of living with anger as a routine. Jesus is directly saying, I hope you're understanding that when I'm talking about the court and a human court, that behind that human court is an analogy of the true court that's coming. John Noland in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount says, once the judge is involved, the wheels of injustice or wheels of justice will be unstoppable. And so all throughout this whole passage, Jesus is saying, I have the power to heal your soul, to extract anger and its power out of your life. Let me do it. Let me do the surgery. I can do it. But if you don't, someday the wheels of justice will start to turn and there will be no lawyer who will be able to get anything out. And some of us who have have grief in our heart and anger and sadness over the things that have happened to us, have to turn these things over to the Lord and pray for the people that they will separate themselves from the sin and the anger that is destroying them. Because someday God will sit down and say, this does not belong in my kingdom. This is what Jesus ultimately is saying. These things do not belong in my kingdom. So I want to end with this. Jesus hates hate and its power to destroy the victim because ultimately Jesus is trying to bring people out of the kingdom of darkness. I want to give you two passages here, and I want this to put goosebumps on your neck because this is what Jesus is actually saying. He's saying that if you love anger, you live in anger, and you habitually let it grow in your life, you are becoming a child of the devil. 
The child, the devil, was meant that all of hell is meant to punish the prince of this world. That's what Jesus said. I've come to, to judge the prince of this world, but if we become a child of the devil, what do you think will happen to us? I want to read a couple passages here and just and appeal to us that if anger is not something that we let Jesus do surgery on, it eventually will take us over and we will turn into something else. This is Jesus' apostle John, and he says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his own brother. And why did he murder him? Because his actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister, as defined by Jesus, not our world, is a murderer. And you know that a murderer has no eternal life residing in him. I want us to understand that Jesus is saying, if you let anger take over your life, that is one of the huge, the main characteristics of what the devil himself is. I want us to understand that these, these words Jesus specifically says are characteristic of Satan. And so in Matthew chapter, or John chapter 8, Jesus is there with some Jewish people and he's confronting them and he's telling, I am, I am God's son. I've come here to rescue the world and they hate him. And, they, and he says, you want to murder me. And listen to what Jesus says. Listen to this, the seriousness of anger. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. There is no truth in him. And so if we refuse to destroy anger in our life, it will destroy us, and someday the stakes will become much higher. Jesus is saying, I want you to be salt and light. I want to be someone who can take all of that anger and change it, transform it, look at other people and have this dignity. When you look at them, you love them. And then when there's sin in their life that's hurting you, you see it as the sin and you pray for the sin to go away and you love them the way I love them and gave myself up for them. I gave them everything. Be the type of people that I am. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so I'm just inviting you I just want to invite you that, there, that these consequences that Jesus are saying, he's saying this is very real. If you let anger destroy you, you will eventually lose the image of God and you will start to bear the image of Satan. It'll destroy your life and someday I'll have no choice but to remove you from my kingdom. These are the real things that Jesus is saying, but the hopeful part of it is that Jesus has the power to actually extract it from our souls. When we have, we have hurt in ourselves, we have all these different things, we, we, we still bring them before the Lord, and God transforms them in the ability to love. I'm not going to, I just want to end with this, and then I want to talk practically with you guys. Jesus sits on the mountain of the Almighty Judge of the human heart. Murder in the heart doesn't belong in God's new kingdom, and Jesus says it comes specifically from the devil who's a murderer. And we need to ask Jesus to actually separate this from our souls, to remove it from us and replace it with love for our brother and sister. Jesus knows our hearts better than us. He knows when Steve makes excuses for being angry and slandering and not loving my brother as myself, not loving my neighbor as myself. And Jesus is saying, Steve, this cannot continue. This week he was talking to me. He's like, this cannot continue in your life, Steve. It needs to go away because I want you to look like me to the world. The world needs my love. It doesn't need your anger. And so I want to ask the question, how does Jesus shepherd us out of anger, hostility, or even indifference into becoming my brother's keeper? How does Jesus practically, what are the steps in the heart that Jesus does to actually, situation to situation, we're starting to get that anger, we're starting to judge the person's heart, their anger, like we're looking at them, what does God do to take us to a place where we love them? What does that look like, guys and gals? Verse 